Thank you uh, so much for that warm welcome. It's a delight to be here. When uh, uh, my wife uh, said, what have they asked you to speak on? And I said, uh, God's care for the poor. She said, you really are typecast, aren't you? <laughs> she said, do they know that you sometimes speak on other things too, besides the poor? I said, well, I'll pass that on. Uh, if uh, you're wondering what other things I speak on, I'd be very happy to talk about the absolutely inspiring captaincy of Matt, uh, oh, uh, the Socceroos captain, Matt uh, Ryan. He has been an inspiring leader. Just one mistake this morning and we're out. But he is inspiring. If you want me to speak about the inspiring leadership of Steve Smith and how he's changed his batting stance and made a double century, I'm very happy to talk about that. I'm not so happy to talk about my beloved Essendon and how they've been going. I've noticed Bill Brown's gone very quiet on Hawthorne too lately. <laughs> Have you noticed? Anyway, it's a great honour to speak uh, on what is uh, the second Sunday of Advent on God's care for the poor. It's not incidental as we come into Advent that Jesus was born in a cow shed, not a palace. That's not accidental. That's not irrelevant. That is right at the heart of the Incarnation. We'll read the words from Isaiah. For unto us a child is born. Wonderful counsel, a mighty God. But born in poverty. Many in the church, when it comes to God caring for the poor, uh, give themselves the leave pass. They say, well, even Jesus himself said, the poor you'll have with you always. So... Why don't we focus on evangelism? After all, isn't that the Great Commission? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Or why don't we focus on worship? God inhabits the praises of his people. And we have seen remarkably, and I think it's been led by Hillsong actually, a, a worship-led renewal across the world. It's amazing that Sunday, today, 50 million people in the world will be selling, singing Hillsong songs. Isn't that quite amazing? And worship is incredibly important. Humans are wired for worship. Make no mistake, humans will worship something. If it's not sex or power or money or themselves, that'll be drugs and addiction. They will give themselves over to something. Truly to worship God beyond ourselves is extraordinarily important. Apart from anything, just psychologically. Soren Kierkegaard, a great Christian philosopher, said, the door to happiness turns outwards. People who worship themselves turning inwards are unhappy, pessimistic, self-obsessed. To open that door beyond ourselves in the first place is to worship that which is worthy of worship God. For some the focus is uh, being on being holy. God is a holy God and therefore we really should focus on that. Well as I look back over my Baptist upbringing I'm now so old I didn't study ancient history I lived through it I have a long association with the Baptist Church. Uh, there's certainly been focuses on evangelism. There's been focuses on worship. But much of my Baptist life has uh, implicitly, subtly focused on holiness. As I think about so many of the debates we had in church, they were debates that were about the set of rules that we will follow how to be different to the world. And if the world sees we're different, they'll be astonished, it'll point to God, and that difference is holiness. I can't tell you the number of sermons I've heard or church meetings I've been in 
where someone has declared or preached a line in the sand. And the line in the sand is really a form of holiness. How we are going to be different. How the culture can't shape us. How we are following the flesh, not the spirit. Uh, the world, not the spirit. We must stay uncontaminated to be the bride of Christ. When I made a list of the debates, I remember in our Baptist Holiness Code, they included these. These are all preached and lines in the sand. The use of candles in worship. Stained glass windows. Let me just check out what Sindel's got here. <laughs> Being divorced. Drinking alcohol, being a pacifist in war, allowing homosexual marriage or homosexual orientation, putting up icons in the church. Allegiance, of course, to the Roman Pope. <laughs> We're against that. Women's ordination. In my mother's age, going to the movies and wearing makeup as an evangelical woman. I can't tell you how relieved my mother was when she heard that Ruth Graham, Billy's wife, wore makeup. <laughs> Suddenly, that line in the sand had shifted. Of course, uh, it was in more recent days games like Hello Dungeons and Dragons, Harry Potter books, rock music. In my youth, we literally spilt blood on the carpet in church meetings, arguing over whether guitars would be allowed. Because the organ we know is what the Apostle Paul played, right? <laughs> Certainly practice, <laughs> practicing, and this is very alive today, indigenous spirituality. Having the head uncovered for women, playing cards, gambling of any kind, smoking, dancing of any kind, full immersion baptism, a line on the sand as Baptists. We don't accept infant baptism. Speaking in tongues, some believed it was almost required to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Others said it's of the devil. Tattoos and body piercing, believing in a sixth day, young earth creation. In previous times, mixed marriages and Freemasonry. That was absolutely a line in the sand. Certainly interfaith marriages, herbal medicine equals witchcraft. Well, I could go on. When I think about all of these, they were effectively a holiness code. They were what got our juices going. They were the energy of what it meant to draw a line and be different. These issues are still with us. I've just come back from a MICA event. Two of your wonderful young people from Sindel were in Canberra for five days. We had 85 people from 14 nations, young Christian emerging leaders. What MICA is trying to do is get to these young leaders before they get into politics and business and get corrupted <laughs> and to show them that there is another way. Often in Pacific countries, they're all Christian leaders, but we know the corruption is pretty terrible. Well, we also had uh, evangelical and Pentecostal indigenous Australians at this uh, micro event. Two days of training, then we went and spoke to 82 politicians uh, this week in, in Canberra. And the um, Aboriginals did a welcome uh, to country with a smoking ceremony. Well, a number, not many, but a few were terribly upset. And it was actually the white Caucasian young people, we had a few of those, with the smoking ceremony. And their smoking lets in the spirits, and how could Micah, a Christian organization, allow this? And I would say to them, absolutely, if you're uncomfortable, don't participate. It's like, for me, the Apostle Paul talking about meat offered to our idols. That was the equivalent then, remember? And some were terribly troubled as Christians and said, absolutely not. The spirits come through that meat and the idols. Paul said, well, they're sort of the weaker brothers. All things are pure to those who are pure. But if they're troubled, withdraw. 
How our freedom of conscience, that's my approach. But it did remind me how the debates are still going on. Back in 2000, we had a Baptist World Alliance meeting here. I happened to be the president of the Baptist Union of Australia. And there was a welcoming service. I hadn't organised any of the program, nothing to do with me. And a smoking ceremony and the American Baptist stormed out. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We can accept that. Even though these are Christian indigenous, most of them Baptists from Yundamu, the Walpuri are Baptist. By the way, if you tell the Walpuri they're not Baptist, they'll kill you. Uh, <laughs> they are warrior Baptist. <laughs> okay, the Americans walked out. It's fascinating to me, you know, later in my ministry to preach in many of those Southern Baptist American churches. There was an American flag at the front at every church. They literally wrapped themselves in the American flag. They talked about the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, as if it was part of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and they all had guns. They uh, often extolled the person who was the richest, the most successful business person in the church. And I'm sitting there thinking, the one God, the only God Jesus talked about, other than the true God, was the God Mammon. Now, I didn't object. This is part of their culture, but it struck me. Aren't we blind to the demons in our own culture? <laughs> but we can so clearly see demons somewhere else. And the lines in the sand are drawn. Well, when we start to think about the holiness codes of my youth and the lines in the sand we drew only for them to be washed away, I thought, you know, we were woke before the term came in. The term woke was a, actually a black civil rights term. It was first used by Martin Luther King. He said, awaken ourselves, be woke, to the way blacks have systemic discrimination, segregation on buses, on schools, in restaurants and diners, in neighbourhoods. Be awake, be woke to the Jim Crow laws that in the... 50s, 60s, before the Civil Rights and Voting Act, literally meant blacks couldn't vote. They still could not get to vote, thanks to those Jim Crow laws. They were unemployable, unable to vote, not equal citizens, locked in poverty. Martin Luther King was saying, awake, be woke to those, look, those things. Now the term woke has taken on, and I sympathise with it, a sort of stricter secular holiness code. Being woke today is about using the right pronouns and trigger alerts and microaggressions and making sure everyone feels safe. No one should feel culturally unsafe. Really, today's wokeness is a secular holiness code. I recognise it because I've lived through religious holiness codes, lines in the sand that are drawn very hard and fast and judge people very, very quickly. Well, if it is evangelism in the Great Commission, evangelism was to make disciples of Jesus. If it is worship, worship is worship of Jesus. If it is holiness, holiness is to be like Jesus. So who's Jesus? What does he ask? What does he expect? Well, to answer that question, we might go to a uh, Bible reading, if we can throw it up. And uh, this Bible reading is really Jesus' home synagogue, synagogue commencement service <laughs> for his whole ministry. It's his inaugural address, his inauguration and definition of his whole ministry. He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim, proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Here at his commencement service, he announces his whole purpose of his ministry. What the signature of his whole ministry, the defining feature of his whole ministry would be. It is to proclaim good news to the poor. That first line sums it all up. The next lines are just filling it out with concrete examples, a bit of explicit detail. Liberty to captives, because if you're imprisoned, you're poor. Sight to the blind, if you're blind in that society, by definition, you have a life of poverty. Liberty to those who are oppressed, the poor. The Deuteronomist said, the poor, there shall be no poor among you and the children of Israel. They shall not be oppressed. That's why every seven years, all debts were forgiven. We prayed the Lord's Prayer this morning. Let thy, we often translate it, sins. The actual Greek word is let thy debts be forgiven. That's actually what was happening every seven years. So the poor wouldn't be oppressed. There would be no poor in, in Israel. Well, then Jesus finishes with, and the favourable year of the Lord. I proclaim that. What was that? That's jubilee. Every seven years, debt's forgiven, so the poor could get a fresh start. Every 50 years in an agrarian society where a woman's husband dies, she has to sell the land to feed her kids. They, in an agrarian society, have no unit of wealth, no way for her sons, when they grow up, or daughters, to actually have a stake, an economic unit, a foothold. Well, come Jubilee, the favourable year of the Lord. This is to see all the land restored to the original owners. So those poor sons, again, and daughters have an agrarian unit of wealth. That's what Jesus is proclaiming. There isn't any historical evidence that Israel actually practiced the Jubilee. But it was their law. It was what Jesus is referring to here. Well, we are starting to understand that the signature message of Jesus is God's care for the poor. And as we prayed in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. You know, a lot of us think that the main question of the Bible is how do we get to heaven? I know this may come as a shock, but the Bible's not really interested in that question. The question the Bible's interested in, the question the Bible answers is, how does heaven get to earth? How does God, who dwelt with us, who walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, who had relationship, deal with the evil and the brokenness so that he can dwell with us in a renewed, restored earth? It's interesting when we think about this, and my uh, autobiography, A Lot With A Little, picks up a little bit of uh, this tension I even saw in my parents. I had wonderful parents. Dad died at 97, some six years ago. Strong evangelical. Read his Greek, Greek New Testament every morning. Prayed for people, witnessed, shared his faith. But Dad really was very focused on heaven. And it was a wonderful faith. I stand in the steps of, of Dad. He, when he was dying, just wanted to get to heaven. Don't have a funeral for me. I won't be there. Rejoice. I'm in heaven. Mum had a very strong Christian faith. 
But her faith was slightly different. Mum was the one when I brought, as she called them, Tim's strays home as a kid. <laughs> Kids from the orphanage. <laughs> she was the one who fed and entertained and welcomed and served and did the community work. She admired Dad's seeking spiritual experiences, his eyes fixed on the next world. But she couldn't quite see the point of climbing the ladder to get to heaven. She thought, have spiritual experiences so we can go back down on earth and live generously now. It's interesting when mum was dying and her funeral was here in February in this church, I said to her, mum, are you looking forward to going to heaven? She said, yeah, that should be interesting, Tim. <laughs> I said, well, dad's up there. He's put the kettle on. He'll be welcoming you with a cup of tea. She said, yeah, that'll be nice. Now, tell me what's going on in politics. Tell me what the grandkids are doing. I realized mum had this sense that, yep, she'll be with the Lord, but the Lord is really concerned with this world. <laughs> Between those bookends of faith, I think I was really, really shaped. Well, Jesus' message, in some ways his commencement service message is more like mum's than dad's faith. It's very this-worldly. He quotes Isaiah. By the way, Jesus quoted Isaiah far more than any other prophet. And Isaiah is a very worldly, universal vision. It's not narrowly focused on Israel. When Jesus quotes Isaiah, he talks about this Messiahship, and he could have quoted this verse from Isaiah, not the one he did in, in Nazareth. Behold my servant who whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out aloud or lift his voice or make it heard in the street. He's not a power ruler. A bruised reed he will not break. A faint burning wick he will not quench. Echoes of the weak, the vulnerable, the poor. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or discouraged until this Messiah has established justice in the earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. The Pacific Islands love that verse. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. They love it because they're in Canberra with us last week saying we're sinking, the water's rising. Climate change isn't theoretical, it's existential. We are going under. You have to help. We're your Christian brothers and sisters. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Well, that passage from Isaiah about the Messiah is he's bringing forth justice for all the nations. And it's an internationalist vision. The whole world, it's not just my chosen Israel, Israel, you might remember, were the rescue plan after Adam and Eve and sinned and after the Tower of Babel. But then the rescue plan, Israel needed rescuing. They disobeyed the covenant. They didn't uh, teach the nations the, uh, of Yahweh. So the rescue plan became, after Israel, the Messiah. The Messiah talked about in Isaiah that Jesus identifies as himself. In your presence, these words are fulfilled. The incarnation of this Messiah was to dwell so God could dwell with us, dealing with evil, injustice, sin, to be reconciled with us, to walk with us. The incarnation of the Messiah was a poor and powerless Messiah, not a wealthy, powerful king or ruler. He was to die on a cross to deal with evil. He was to rise from the dead that sees the liberation of us and the world. The liberation that Paul describes in Romans 8, all of creation, nature itself, groaning as in childbirth, wanting the liberation of a renewed earth where there is justice and equity. Jesus is focused on the poor. 
Isaiah 11, we'll read this at Christmas from the, from the shoot or the stump of Jesse, there shall come forth someone and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or his ears hear, but with justice. He shall protect the poor. He shall decide with equity for the meek of the earth. See how broad this vision is. How worldly this vision is. Well, as we start to celebrate this Messiah at Christmas, we do remember that Jesus and his disciples kept breaching the holiness code of his time, eating with sinners, touching bleeding women, touching lepers, healing on the Sabbath when you weren't meant to do any work. He was in terrible trouble for breaching the holiness code. That tells us that with this Messiah, when he proclaims good news for the poor, it's not good news for just those who obey the holiness codes. It's not good news necessarily for the powerful, though it can be, if they repent. It's not good news for the rich, though it can be, if they're generous. It's good news for the poor. This Christmas, a babe in swaddling clothes in a manger, a food feeding lot with straw, not a beautiful humor crib or whatever else our kids have. It's why when we give to Baptist World Aid, sponsor a child, feed the hungry, home the ho homeless, shelter those fleeing domestic violence, support indigenous work, support those working against climate change. It's why people of this Messiah, Christians, will be known for that, not known for what we're against. It saddens me that the church now is only known for what we're against. We're against maybe those who are working uh, for climate change or gays or we're fighting the culture wars. We should be known for what we're for, that we love God and we love our neighbor, full stop. That's what it's about, particularly those neighbors who are powerless and poor. Well, but didn't Jesus say, the poor you'll have with you always? I think we've completely misinterpreted that verse. I believe because Jesus' signature message was good news for the poor. When he said to his disciples, the poor you'll have with you always, he was saying, you won't be able to follow me without being close to the poor. That's why you're going to have the poor with you always. It's impossible to follow me without having a heart for the poor. That's why you're going to have the poor with you always, rather than, oh, they're just an option for, I don't know, a World Vision or a Tim Costello. This is part of our discipleship. Following Jesus is following a God who cares for the poor, who will renew this world. Let me finish by saying that this Christmas we will worship a babe who defined messiahship as a God for the poor, a God of love who loves all of us, who is renewing this world. This is the Jesus who defined his messiahship at Nazareth to proclaim good news for the poor. Amen.